Dr. Joanna Chikwe. Uh, thank you so much for that ex extraordinarily kind and generous introduction. It's a real honor to be speaking at Yale, which has really been at the forefront of not only some of the um, basic understanding, basic science understanding of some of the things I'm about to talk to, but also at the forefront of the um, clinical outcomes research, as you'll see. Um, I have the following disclosures. As mentioned, I'm the PI of Transform, which is an NIH funded pivotal randomized trial in the space of transcatheter repair versus surgery for primary mitral regurgitation. And Cedar sinai receives fees and honoraria um, from many of the companies um, that you'll see these prostheses. I, I do not um, have any financial disclosures. Um, and I want to talk about really three aspects of primary mitral regurgitation um, that I think are evolving and of relevance to our practice. Um, the first one is earlier intervention. The second one is focusing on expert intervention. And the third one is focusing on transcatheter intervention. Um, so let's start with earlier intervention. And um, although I wrote this slide two weeks ago for another um, talk based on a 47 year old man I'd seen the day before in the office, I actually saw a 46 year old man who's almost the exact same uh, yesterday in the office who also feels fine, uh, which he defines being able to play five sets of tennis, he went skiing in Colorado, was able to manage altitude just... Dr. Uh, Chigri, may I please interrupt you and ask you to share your screen because we're oh, not... Oh gosh, yes. Screen. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a Zoom fail of the first order. I thought I had that shared, sorry. Um, there we go. So able to see that fine? Yes, that looks fine, thank that's you. That's terrific. So a uh, 47 year old man who feels absolutely fine, he's got no other medical history or risk factors and a completely normal physical exam, except for a very loud pansystolic murmur. And you're not quite excited by the transthoracic echo from the outside hospital, you repeat a transesophageal echo and you can see this very obvious um, prolapse of his posterior leaflet, seems to be single segment with an anteriorly directed jet. His LV dimensions are preserved. His function is preserved at 60%. And I think you've got obviously a few options here. Um, and we can all decide amongst ourselves whether we, given how functional he is and the lack of symptoms and the preservation of his LV function on echo, whether we just repeat that echo in three months, uh, whether we want to see what he does under stress in terms of his LV function, his PA pressures, um, if we were on the fence about his MR grade, um, whether we want to just refer him directly to an interventionalist, either a cardiac catheterization to set him up for surgery, mitral clip repair or surgical repair. And we're obviously going to focus on this, which is primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation. Um, the pathology is excessive leaflet motion, usually due to redundancy of tissue and caudal elongation and leaflet redundancy, sometimes caudal rupture. Um, and that causes the very sort of characteristic findings on echo. That there's obviously a spectrum that you see on echo, and I'll touch on that later. But in the OR, this is the commonest thing that we see, which is this prolapse, which is isolated to PD, you can clearly see there's a ruptured cord there. And that segment is supported either side by these cords, which are actually of a correct height. So the rest of that posterior leaflet is not prolapsing. This is one of the simplest repairs we do. This is a very straightforward triangular section where I'm simply going to take out that triangle of prolapsing tissue, um, preserving the cords either side that are at the normal height, and then just join those edges together in a way that really preserves um, the coaptation um, and restores competency. Um, this I'm doing robotically, that's my standard approach. Um, most surgeons would do this, I think, just open. And this stitch is probably the most important. This is um, going to really ensure that you've got a completely smooth captation. I'm rolling the edges under. Um, and you don't want to take too much. You don't want to take too little. I think you get a sense that it's not really a one size fits all approach. Um, each valve looks very different when you meet it in the operating room. Um, and it's a very fine judgment between sort of taking too much, not, not taking quite enough. Another way that you can repair something like this is by creating artificial cordy. And again, there's a little bit of an art of setting the height of those cords that there's no sort of one size fits all. This is going to be supported by an annuloplasty ring because without that, the valve wouldn't be competent at this stage and it wouldn't be a durable repair. 
um, saline testing, which is injecting saline into the left ventricle under pressure. And that's just a very sort of loose eyeball test to see that that holds saline under pressure. And obviously we're going to sort of recheck that on the post bypass TE. And what I want to see is no gradients, no MR. And I would do a second clamp time to go back if that wasn't the case. And as I mentioned, the, the top example is of um, a single segment P2 prolapse. Um, and we see a huge spectrum from that all the way to this at the bottom, which is a Barlow's valve, which is much, much larger. It looks the same size on the photo, but in the operating room, that would actually be double the size of the valve above. And every single segment is prolapsing. So much more involved repair. And I feel with my transcatheter colleagues that we're all chasing the single segment P2 prolapse. That's good for mitral clip. It's good for surgery. And the Barlow's valves are not great for mitral clip and certainly a little bit more challenging for surgery. Um, just for sake of completeness, um, we're not talking about a, uh, um, this, which is functional MR. And um, you can see here that the leaflets are entirely normal. Um, the issue is that annular dilatation has caused, um, and ventricular dilatation from ischemia is called papillary muscles posteriorly to be retracted, which is what causes the posterior leaflet to get tethered in the MR, and that's fixed by an annuloplasty ring. Here you can see the amount of coaptation tissue underneath that coaptation line, the purple marks of coaptation line, and this affects a repair. Um, it's not the most durable repair because the pathology is not within the leaflets. The pathology is within the um, ventricles. So let me just restart that video. So the whole of this talk from now on is really focusing on that first one, primary um, degenerative mitral regurgitation. So I think that we're all very comfortable with operating on symptomatic patients, and that's based on data predominantly from the Mayo series. Um, and this one's a very good example. It's an early study where patients were stratified by NYHA class at the time of surgery, and you can very clearly hear this see that the second dotted line, which represents patients where the surgeons had waited for NYHA class three, four symptoms and substantially worse survival after surgery. And in a much more recent series, and this is across 20 studies in a predominantly French registry, looking at 2000 patients, even waiting sort of a month in patients, two months, three months in patients that had um, symptoms and surveilling them with uh, repeat echocardiography was associated in, in matched patients with a drop in survival, in late survival after surgery. So early surgery ahead of onset of symptoms is a class one indication based on this um, observational data. Importantly, um, in the asymptomatic patient, there are several flags. And again, they're based on all of these observational studies. Um, a key one is ejection fraction. Um, the, the marker that everybody holds on for is for the EF to drop below 60%. Um, and again, based on this study, which showed a, a very significant survival drop once it dropped below 60%. So that's why the presence of LV dysfunction defined as an EF of less than 60% is a class one indication for intervention in asymptomatic patients with degenerative MR. How reliable is the left ventricular ejection fraction? I think this thought experiment by Blaise Carabello in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which he published in 1997, is worth going through just step by step because it really explains clearly why EF is an unreliable marker of LV function. So here's the normal ventricle, and you can see that with an end diastolic volume of 150, and then systolic volume of 50, you can calculate the volume ejected, which is 100, and you can obviously calculate the ejection fraction, which is 100 divided by 150. You've got a normal EF of 67%. In acute mitral regurgitation, um, you have some acute compensatory changes. So your ventricle kind of distends a little bit, fraction. It's hyperdynamic, hypercontractile. So it's able to go, get down to an end systolic of 30. And you can calculate the ejection fraction again. Um, but this time you obviously have to add the backwards ejection fraction of 70. So the ejection fraction is 140, 70 plus 70, um, divided by 170. Your EF is 80%. 
why are these patients in extremis? Well, they're obviously in extremis because despite the supernormal EF, only half the normal ejection fraction or less, two thirds is going forward. So you're in a low cardiac output state. And because of the lack of compliance in the left atrium, which is a still a small chamber, you've got high PA pressures and pulmonary edema. So that's why those patients are in extremis, despite a supernormal um, left ventricular ejection fraction. The patient that we described sitting in my office has got chronic compensated mitral regurgitation. He's incredibly well compensated. And that's because um, eccentric hypertrophy has allowed this ventricle not only to stretch, but to increase its um, contractility. So the end diastolic volume is much larger, it's 240. His end systolic volume is preserved, it's, it's 50. Um, and he's able to eject near normal cardiac output, 95 forward, um, but his total ejection fraction is actually much increased. This is 80%, and that's what I expect to see when I look at um, transthoracic echoes that these patients bring. Um, I want to see a supranormal ejection fraction. And if I don't, if I see a so-called normal ejection fraction of 60%, I'm concerned. This is why. So on the left, you've got our normal compensated patient. On the right, you've got chronic decompensated mitral regurgitation. Now chronic hypertrophy um, has translated into a large ventricle. So the end diastolic volume is now large. There is a lack of contractility now. The end systolic volume is, is much larger than before. We're down to about 110. And the forward ejection fraction against systolic pressure is now low. We're back looking at what may be a low cardiac output state. And the backwards ejection fraction is actually slightly higher because it's easier to eject backwards into that now large, very compliant left atrium. But because of the raised end diastolic pressure in the ventricle, that left atrial pressure is higher. So that patient is the patient that complains of congestive heart failure symptoms. They may be orthopnic. Um, they may have perhaps this monotonal dyspnea, they're certainly dyspneic on exertion. And the ejection fraction is 60%. It's the backwards fraction of 85 plus the forwards of 65 divided by the end diastolic. An ejection fraction of 60% to me is concerning. Um, I will certainly tell the patient that they've got a problem. Um, and I will probably tell the referring cardiologist and the patient to expect that EF once I have fixed that valve to drop well below 60%, because that ventricle is not normal at baseline. Um, and once you've closed off that easy back pressure route, you will actually see the true function of the ventricle. It's not a function of poor cardio protection or a long clamp time. It's a function of a ventricle that was very abnormal and under the abnormality was underread by how we calculate the ejection fraction. So that's, one of the reasons why left ventricular dilatation, if you see that on the echo, it's a real hallmark and it's associated with significantly worse survival after surgery. Again, these are Mayo Clinic patients stratified by whether they underwent surgery with an LVESD greater or less than 40 millimeters and the dilated patients do worse. So that's why those markers, EF and LVSD 60 and 40 are big green go signs for asymptomatic patients with degenerative MR. If you wait until those patients have symptoms, you have missed the boat in terms of their ventricles ability to remodel. Atrial fibrillation, which is regarded by many as relatively benign, isn't. Um, again, Mayo Clinic series associated with a five-fold increase in sudden death in patients with severe degenerative MR while they're waiting for surgery. Um, so that's why atrial fibrillation and similarly, pulmonary hypertension pop up as a 2A indication in asymptomatic patients. And then there are softer indications such as progressive in increase in LV size measured over three echoes and also left atrial dilatation. So that's why the current reiteration and actually for about the last decade, iterations of our guidelines have said that mitral repair is reasonable in asymptomatic patients with chronic degenerative MR with preserved dimensions when the likelihood, and this is really important, of a successful and durable repair without residual MR is greater than 95% and the expected surgical mortality is less than 1%. It's actually the same as the European guidelines. There's this emphasis on 
what is the result of surgery if you're going to intervene early in these patients. And as a very brief, it doesn't really need a lot of exposition, the value of a mitral valve repair over replacement is based on this data that suggests that if you can repair a degenerative valve, you restore the patient to normal life expectancy, which is this red line for an age matched population, compared to mitral valve replacement, which doesn't, for many, many reasons in degenerative patients. Essentially, repair preserves your left ventricular geometry. It takes away the prosthesis related complications, such as need for anticoagulation and um, prothrombotic state, need for redo surgery if it's done in a way that's competent and durable. So let's talk about that balance then between what the guidelines want us to achieve when we intervene on patients and um, what's in fact the reality for many patients. And I think it's interesting to start with this, you know, we've all made this assumption in this talk that we know what severe um, MR looks like and the indications for surgery. So one of the quantitative indications is an ERO of greater than 40. Again, oh, it's another Mayo paper. Um, this one from the New England Journal of Medicine, which really stratified patients according to ERO um, that were asymptomatic with severe degenerative, with degenerative mitral regurgitation and looked at survival. And there's often a lot of arguing um, between interventionists looking for clear cut guidelines as to does this patient have severe MR or not, should I intervene or not? and images that say, well, it, it's, it's not severe, it's not moderate, it's moderate to severe. I think wherever you land, you can see that a ERO greater than 20, in this case, this is 20 to 39, this is greater than 40, is associated with substantially worse survival um, compared, compared to a moderate or um, mild um, regurgitation. But the cutoff we use is, is 40 to define severe. Um, how reliably does ECHO tell us this information? So if we want to do guideline concordant practice, clearly we need to accurately be able to assess the grade, the severity of mitral regurgitation. We want to be able to describe the mechanism because that's really key in telling a patient um, whether they're repairable or not. Obviously we need to talk about etiology because clearly this only applies to degenerative MR. Rheumatic endocarditis, we've already said functional, these are less amenable to repair. We'd like to know the left ventricular ejection fraction and we would like to know the left ventricular dimensions based on echo. And what I thought was fascinating was that stellar center of excellence, the Mayo that described all these wonderful series of patients according to um, their survival according to intervention, also did an interesting study that looked at echo quality and they looked at echo labs within the Mayo system and outside, and they also looked at echo labs according to whether they were accredited or non-accredited. And the summary of the study, and it was looking at um, how MR was described and reported in an over 300 patients. Um, it's a recent publication, this is contemporary practice, was that quantification of mitral regurgitation was of suboptimal quality and non-diagnostic in a th almost a third of studies. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. One of the major issues they found was this inter-observer variability. And so when you're looking at patients trying to decide if they've got severe or moderate mitral regurgitation, um, the numbers in blue represent where there was agreement between two different echo labs or echocardiographers, and the numbers in red represent disagreement. So in at least a quarter and sometimes more cases, um, one echo would be read as um, severe and the same echo read by a different echocardiographer would be read as moderate. And that's not unusual, that's not unique to the Mayo. This is a series published in Jack um, that involved five centers. It's actually a prospective trial. So these are expert centers running a prospective trial. And this is severe MR. And you can see that in this case, a third of patients, um, sorry, a quarter of patients, this case, um, a quarter of patients that have severe MR by one echo reader, a class is having moderate by another. And in this case, it's 15 out of the sort of 40 total that were severe were classed as moderate. So huge, huge disagreement. Um, and that's critical, because this is a critical decision point. Quite how critical it is, is described further on in that Mayo paper where they looked at what happened to these patients. So the planned operation was canceled in 80% of patients with discordant grading because the valve lesion was felt to be less than severe. I mean, that's astonishing. 
In 15% of patients, the valve lesion was graded severe by the echocardiogram performed at our institution, which led to an operation that would have not been done because it wouldn't have been indicated based on the external read on the echo. This is not old data, and this is not an inexperienced sensor. Um, this really highlights a fairly significant challenge. And it's not just about concordance of reading and disagreement. It's about even just basic things like reporting parameters. So we talked about the importance of dimensions and size and morphology. This is just the percentage of echo reports in that Mayo system study, 330 mitral patients that didn't have, or in this case had these parameters reported. So 10% of echoes didn't even report LV dimensions or size. Um, when you look at the important things for deciding about repairability, not reporting the presence or absence of prolapse or flail um, really takes that off the table in terms of decision making. And yes, of course, often it is because you don't get great windows or you can't see. Um, and that really sort of is important to, to sort of, I think, consider when you're seeing these patients in the office, that there's a real lack of um, clarity. So for guideline concordant practice, ERO, mitral regurgitation grade, um, discordance in a significant proportion. The mechanisms and etiology not reported in a very large proportion. We've already described how ejection fraction is an unreliable marker of surgery and that the dimensions were missing in about 10%. So that's the imaging that gets our patients to be having the conversation about, do they need surgery? What about should they have surgery? Well, we've kind of said those guidelines are based on sort of this ideal world and we've all published our single sensor, single surgeon series where we show these things on the left, which is what the guidelines are based around, operative mortality of less than 1%, stroke rates are low, the repair rates are 95, 99%, and you leave the operating room without residual mitral regurgitation. The recurrence rates are low, the reoperation rates are extremely low. And obviously the patients want a full functional recovery that's fast and hopefully cosmetic. And, you know, what are most of these patients that don't go to these super experienced single center series getting if you follow the guidelines? So this looks at um, all US practice and I think it's about 13,000 mitral valve operations and looking at risk adjusted operative mortality. So you're adjusting for baseline risk and you can see that in the highest volume centers, you're achieving those really excellent sub 1% mortality. Um, you're not doing that in many low volume centers. And this isn't a straight line relationship. It isn't even a super tight relationship. There are plenty of low volume centers that achieve excellent outcomes. Um, I have been a chief at a low volume center that had, you know, 99% repair rates, you know, next to 1% mortality and stroke rates but there is clearly wide practice variation. Um, and it's the same for stroke. Um, here are stroke rates from uh, US practice up to 2%. Um, and here are repair rates in New York. And this, again, this was a recent data. Um, this is not historic. And this is looking each blue line as a hospital and repair rates are um, vertical. And you can see that repair rates in hospitals in New York state um, range from 198% down to less than 50%, which to me was astonishing. This is for degenerative patients. These are all repairable valves. Um, and then this is individual surgeons. So each red dot represents an individual surgeon. And again, there's an astonishing variability in repair rates from a group of surgeons that almost never repair a valve to surgeons that repair it almost all the time. And again, just to highlight, Volume doesn't necessarily mean that you are a surgeon that repairs a 100% repairable valve 100% of the time. Um, you may be repairing it 70, 80% of the time. Um, and that translates also into the quality of the repair. So let's say you've sent your patients to the operating room and they left with a beautiful repair and they hopefully have trace MR. Repairs do fail. If they fail sort of two, three, four, 10 years out, we can often say that that's a function of disease progression, disease pathology. If they fail within 12 months, it's much more likely to be technical. There was a you know, mischoice of ring, the cords aren't sized right, too much tissue resected, not enough tissue resected, a lesion was missed. 
And this study, we looked at durability of mitral valve repair and the failures within 12 months, and we stratified them by whether the surgeon saw the mitral valve more than twice a month. So that's the surgeons in red, they do 25 or more a year, or less than 25 a year, and that's in blue. And you can see that the lower volume surgeons had three times, three times the failure, technical failure rate of mitral valve repair within 12 months. These are surgeons needing to go back to the operating room um, to have re-repair or replacement. And that failure rate um, of those less busy surgeons of 3% a year is been reported in other more expert series. This is a Barlow valve series from a very established group. And again, out of 10 years, and this wasn't looking at patients going back to the operation, this is looking at freedom from moderate or worse mitral regurgitation. Nearly 30% of patients have significant uh, regurgitation in that series out of 10 years. So this ideal of fantastic outcomes isn't necessarily matched by broad general practice where operative mortality is probably double what the guidelines are indicating is the requirement for operating in asymptomatic patients without class one indications. Um, the stroke rates are higher, the repair rates are much, much, much lower. The residual MR rates are higher, the recurrence of MR is higher and reoperation is, is definitely higher. And this is not as complicated a figure as it looks. It's a figure that's attempting to tie that all up, that what shifts you from watchful waiting to early intervention is this balance of risks. And if your repair mortality is low, and your probability of repair is high and your stroke rate is low and your replacement mortality is next to zero, really you are very confident about telling the patient the right thing to do is intervene. Particularly if you think they've got a high chance of developing symptoms while waiting. Whereas if these are skewed to the left because of your access to that level of expertise, then you're very, very right to sit tight and wait. But on balance, you're probably doing that patient a disservice just based on those survival curves that we saw. So now let's talk about how transcatheter intervention is changing this whole picture. So um, you all know what a transcatheter edge to edge repair looks like. Um, this slide is in here because I, I usually use it with audiences that might not be so familiar. And the last randomized controlled trial of transcatheter edge to edge repair for degenerative patients was Everest 2. Um, and as you can see from this table, about a third of the patients were functional, but it does tell us some things about degenerative um, patients. And the clear sort of benefit with surgery was in these three patient populations, patients that were younger, the patients that had degenerative disease, and the patients that had preserved um, left ventricular fraction. Um, this is very old data. The, the patient was trial enrolled between 2005 and 2008. And that's worth thinking about because practice has obviously moved on. I don't know if it's moved on so um, dramatically, though, um, across the board, because the same practice variation that we describe for surgery also exists in the efficacy of transcatheter mitral valve repair. These are centers from the TVT registry. Um, it's a recent cohort, I think 2015 to 2018, stratified by the number of cases that each center does. And you can see that the failure rates range from around 20% to 30%. And by failure, we mean that the patients are left. And these are predominantly degenerative patients with moderate or severe mitral regurgitation at 30 days, die or need surgery. And so this is sort of encapsulated in our current guidelines, um, which really reserve uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair for high or prohibitive risk surgical patients with anatomy that's favorable for a transcatheter approach and a life expectancy um, greater than one year. All of the other patients that you would um, see in the office with degenerative MR, be they symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, are really recommended for surgery. And really with a very, very strong emphasis on repair for pretty much every category. 
um, irrespective of functional status, age. Um, the benefits of TIA though are worth thinking about because this is really what influences patients and to a certain extent physician decision-making. And from the Abbott website, Abbott is the manufacturer of the Mitra clip. Um, and this is largely based on CARP data. There's this real emphasis on the sort of um, quality of life really um, that patients might expect with a transcatheter approach. Although um, co-apts led to um, really opening of the sort of gates for mitra clip and tear for functional um, patients, the TVT registry clearly shows that the vast, vast majority of patients that are undergoing transcatheter repair are degenerative and they're not all high risk. So when we think about risk, we talk about the predicted risk of mortality um, score. And the red here represents the 25th percentile of patients. That's 25% of patients have an STS prom in current practice undergoing mitra clip of 2% or less. That's a quarter of patients have a low risk, predicted risk of mortality with surgery. And that's in part because they've been adjudicated as frail. Let me go backwards. Um, and frailty is a real subjective measure. You know, you, you and I may both look at a 60 kilo, 80 year old and judge them as frail. Um, but I know I can get that patient through an operation safely um, with a great functional outcome. And I don't see that as frailty that precludes a surgical intervention or mandates a transcatheter approach in the right hands. So frailty is incredibly subjective and this gray one, unusual of circumstances, whatever that is, that's basically being used to shunt patients with a low STS score into such a high risk strategy that they um, are purported to qualify as higher prohibitive risk is, I think it's really worth understanding what those patients really look like and what procedure they might really benefit from. And the reason for that is this, this is current US practice. We've looked at patients that are aged over 65 based on CMS data, because it's really the only way we have to get an understanding of what's happening because the surgery registries and the transcatheter registries are separate. You, you can't sort of combine them and figure it out for many reasons. Um, and you can see what is happening. It's very different to what happened in the transcatheter aortic valve area where TAVA really expanded the population of patients eligible for therapy. That hasn't happened with MitraClip. The total population of patients has expanded by about 3%. What has happened is that these patients who were previously undergoing surgical repair, and these are degenerative patients, are now undergoing MitraClip instead. So most of these patients were probably decent surgical candidates. So that raises some interesting questions, particularly when you see this level of practice variation. And that's important because if a third of those patients fail in some centers and 20% in high volume centers are left with moderate or worse MR or need surgery, it does ask you, what is the result of surgery for a failed mitra clip in a patient with degenerative disease? And right now, and again, this is actually just published in Jack. Um, it's a 95% chance that you're leaving the operating room with a replacement if the reason you went into the operating room is that you had a failed mitra clip for your degenerative P2 prolapse. These valves are not re-repairable. Um, we do re-repair them, but it's really, really hard and the results are not necessarily durable. So most of these patients are gonna end up with a replacement. Um, the other thing that is interesting is that this is not a question, this question that I'm clearly working towards, which is what's the right um, therapy for a patient with severe degenerative MR? Is it transcatheter clip or is it surgery? And which patient should have which? This is not well suited to looking at retrospective data. Here we've propensity matched uh, 745 patient pairs and looked at survival um, out to three years, I think, with surgery versus two. And you can see there's a stratospheric difference, but clearly you've got to expect there are a whole bunch of unmeasured confounders that we couldn't adjust for, and perhaps frailty is one of them. And when you look at the five-year outcomes of Everest, which was that original randomized trial we talked about, 
if you take away this early drop off in mortality after failed mitral clip, emergency conversion to surgery, the, su the survival curves are actually very, very similar. And that kind of begs the question whether it's really time for a trial of transcatheter versus surgery in degenerative patients. And we've learned several lessons from transcatheter trials in the functional MR space. I am sure this is presented multiple times to user group and you know this data very, very well. So what I want to highlight is the reason for those major differences in two very supposedly similar patient populations asking similar questions was the size of the studies, the difference in power, slight differences in the inclusion criteria and the way those treatments patients were treated, slightly more aggressive and successful use in one trial and longer follow-up. And those are the things that led to one trial having a positive outcome and the other not doing so. So clearly the strengths of randomized data uh, is going to be a good way to prove causality and it's the best way to show efficacy and safety. We don't want to be using that retrospective type study because of the issues with um, selection bias. The disadvantage of a trial is this need for clinical equipoise. People have to be happy to randomize and patients need to be happy to be randomized. That leads to patients that aren't representative being included who have quite tight inclusion criteria. A long lead time, either that or you're having a short follow-up. You may be reliant on surrogate endpoints, crossover may be a problem, it's expensive, and that means that these trials are generally industry driven. Equipoise is important. We surveyed uh, 50 interventionalists and surgeons, and there's a strong demonstration of equipoise for randomizing these patients. And it's in that setting that this French trial is already about two thirds through enrolled. It's a non-inferiority trial, which um, we can maybe talk about later. It's focused on high-risk patients. Um, it's got a co-primary endpoint, which is one year death. And it's only following patients out to one year and it's a small trial, 330 patients. And I think already looking at that, you can probably get a sense that that is a trial that probably will not show a significant difference. And because it's a non-inferiority trial, um, that will favor use of the device possibly appropriately, these are high-risk patients. High-risk patients represent a very small percentage of um, patients that undergo surgical repair currently. And this Abbott trial, um, Repair MR, um, which is also looking at degenerative patients, transcatheter versus surgery, is slightly broader. They're interested in intermediate risk patients, which they've defined as an STS of two or greater. So as you see, that was maybe 75% of patients um, undergoing uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair now. Um, and the endpoints, again, relatively short, two years, so you're not really gonna have time to tell if there's a survival benefit or not, it's likely. And targeting 500 patients. They started enrolling in July last year. I believe they've enrolled 28 patients. One of the reasons they're struggling to enroll is because, again, this is a relatively small group of patients. Um, and I think both of these trials ask the question about non-inferiority. This is worth understanding. I'll spend like maybe one minute talking about it. So here's a sort of map that I think we all understand very clearly. You've got a trial. This is sort of the null point where there's no difference. This favors a novel treatment. And if your trial outcome is here, it's clearly superior. Your novel treatment is clearly superior to the standard. And you can think of this as relative risk, or you can think of this as an adverse events. So here the superior treatment has less adverse events, be it death, uh, freedom from severe MR, and here it has more adverse events. What a non-inferiority trial does is basically create a margin by which we think that this new treatment has is worse, but it's not unacceptably worse. And so for example, if we were comparing clips, Let's just pretend that the non-inferiority margin says, um, oops, I'll accept 15% worse mortality or 15% worse severe MR because I think that trade-off is worth it. And for some patients, that's absolutely correct. The trade-off of having a less invasive procedure is worth the excess of adverse events here. But you can clearly see already that where you set that non-inferiority margin is really, really important. 
if you set a tight non-inferiority margin, that might be reasonable for something like death. You, you accept a slightly higher risk of death for a fast recovery, lack of, um, let's say, stroke or adverse events. If you set a very wide inferiority margin, it's clearly going to bias the trial in favor of the novel device. And this kind of result also makes a lot of sense to me. Um, this comparison of a new device versus say a surgical procedure or an old device is non-inferior. The, the new device is about the same as the old. You could go either way. Where I have concern is that this is also non-inferior. So in a standard trial, this would clearly be inferior. You've crossed the threshold where there was a difference. The confidence intervals are also both above, but because it's in this non-inferiority margin that you set, you pre-specified in your protocol, you can still say that this inferior device is actually non-inferior. And then you have indeterminate and inferior. And I think, and this one's clearly inferior, um, but this is how far your confidence intervals had to be away for this to count as inferior in the reporting of this trial's results, whereas this would be uh, actually grounds for the FDA to, to approve the, the device. Um, and that's why this trial, which is an NIH funded, funded investigator initiated pivotal trial in the same space is I think going to be so important. Um, the first reason is because we've designed it as a superiority trial. We want to know which treatment is better and then we want to know in which patient populations. So the primary aim is to evaluate long-term effectiveness and safety of mitral surgery versus transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. And that's important. We all saw that with Excel. If you look at short-term outcomes, you often miss the survival benefits that take three, five, 10 years to emerge. The secondary aim is to analyze the relationship between adequacy of MR correction at one year and long-term clinical outcomes. And then our third aim is to look at patient-centered outcomes, including quality of life. And as I've said, it's a superiority design. It's open label. So we're not restricting ourselves to one device because of our sponsor makes one device. And that's important because the centers and countries where we're conducting the trial have other devices approved. And we do think the strategy is much more important than a single device. The other key thing is that we recognize that by the time this trial completes, this conversation will have moved forward and we will be talking about low risk patients. So we're including every patient over the age of 65 with MR that the local heart team agrees are suitable for both surgical and transcatheter intervention. And that means we will be including low, intermediate and high risk patients. Um, and clearly there's a spectrum and my um, view is that the local heart teams will all agree on these patients and these patients with the Barlow's valves won't, won't be entering into this trial. And the primary endpoint is all cause mortality, um, valve reintervention, urgent visits for heart failure or um, admissions for heart failure or onsets of greater than th three plus MR or three plus MR with a minimum follow-up of three years, but we're going to extend it out to five years depending on the event rate. The key secondary endpoints are adjusted for risk. And this is important because the outcome that you achieve in an intermediate or high risk patient, it's got to be different standard for a very, very low asymptomatic um, or low risk patient. And um, we're also going to look at quality of life. So as I close, this gives you sort of an idea of, I think these are three really important trials. I think one thing, the other thing that we learned from COAPT and MITRA FR is that the value of two trials was really rather synergistic. It gave us a much more sophisticated understanding of differences in patient selection, patient management, patient treatment. And we hope that these three trials will achieve the same. Um, so in summary, three real shifts in paradigm. Um, first of all, earlier repair. Don't wait until your patient has symptoms or a demonstrable drop in EF. Earlier repair is associated with superior survival predicated on your ability to access expert repair with near 100% repair rates, low mortality and excellent durability. Transcatheter repair offers you minimal possibility of surgical re-repair. Um, and three randomized trials, including Transformer, comparing transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair versus surgery for degenerative MR. So thank you very much. Very happy to take any questions. And we seem to have three in the chat. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Dr. Chigre. I think some more questions will roll in, but if you do want to look um, at the chat, you've got a question from Dr. Seltzer and uh, you can take a look at that and answer. Yeah, that's a great question. Should, so Dr. Seltzer asks, should centers of excellence with best surgical results use different criteria in assessing surgical risk? STS scores may be overestimating surgical risk, shifting patients to a less ideal repair. Um, I, I think that question is phenomenal and it shows um, great insight. It also characterizes um, conversations we have with patients in the office. And we don't have a formal um, or objective way of, of framing those questions. All I can say to my patients is, you know, we've looked at our series of a thousand robotic repairs. I know that we had uh, one patient that left the OR with a replacement. We had uh, two mortalities in that series. If we look at patients with your exact risk profile, I, would, I can quote you a risk. And I think that's really the best that we can do now. There's an uh, effort by the American Heart Association to identify mitral valve centers of excellence. And they're attempting to sort of, I think really create a basket whereby um, we submit outcomes and they can look at repair rates, uh, mortality, um, the quality of our follow-up. Um, and whether that translates into using a different sort of way of framing STS scores, um, I, I think it's it's difficult to advocate for that. So the best thing I feel that you can do is present your own data to your own patients. What it's difficult though for is for cardiologists and patients that are looking at you from outside, just trying to identify which of the centers that um, can achieve really these sort of excellent results. Uh, there's a question from Evgeny Sholnik. Um, is there any reason stroke is not an endpoint in your study? Yes, and that's a great question. So the stroke is an endpoint in the, I'm going to say it's the Abbott study. Um, and the interesting thing about stroke is that it's a really key endpoint for patients. It's a really rare endpoint. Um, so we've got it as a key secondary outcome, and we've got it according to NVARC criteria. So there's a very um, careful and detailed screening for stroke and assessment of stroke. The reason it's not in the primary endpoint is that stroke tends to move in the opposite direction to mortality in surgical versus transcatheter trials. That's important in a composite endpoint because it really reduces the power of the study. So you would need many more patients to see a difference one. And the reason it's, I suspect, included as an endpoint in the non-inferiority design trials is because it moves in the opposite um, direction, it's much more likely to bias the trial in favor of the novel device in a non-inferiority design. Um, so we're measuring it. We think it's important. We will report it, but that's why it's not in the primary endpoint. It's a key secondary um, endpoint. Joe, it's Eric Velasquez. First of all, thank you so much for joining us today and, 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 and speaking so eloquently to our group. My question for you, um, and you know, excited about Transform and, and the, CT, the, the, the surgical networks uh, uh, planning to take this on. I, I wanna ask you about your approach to preoperative preparation of these patients. Um, we don't give it a lot of discussion because the general thinking obviously has been that you can't treat DMR with medicines. But I think as we learn more about particularly new agents, um, we, we recognize that you know, we can modify filling pressures as our components that could prepare the patient for the best surgical outcome at the least risk. And so I just wanted to get your perspective on, on how you can tell our audience here how uh, we can help our surgeons uh, most effectively prepare, our, prepare patients for, for surgery when we refer to them. That's a really great question. And I have to say, it's um, you're talking to the, a person that's got a sort of about sort of 15 years of bias towards, um, look, here's a problem. It's got a very elegant interventional solution. Why, why would you, um, yeah, how, eff how effective is sort of pharmacological management of what's essentially a very structural problem? I think there's clearly a huge role in functional um, mitral regurgitation in terms of optimizing patients. That can be quite transformative. Um, it's not something that I've got great experience with in primary degenerative MR patients at all. And 
generally my message has been very couched toward much more towards just the early recognition of criteria by which those patients are going to ben benefit from a repair. Um, so I'm very interested to hear what you feel are good pharmacological adjuncts in, in that patient population. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an area where, you know, part, yeah, it'd be very interesting to kind of integrate that into transform as maybe a subsidy or, or something. But, but I guess the question specifically is related to the, the utilization of, of, uh, of right heart catheterizations preoperatively to kind of estimate pressures and to kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 effectively diurese or modify LA filling pressures in advance. And uh, that's kind of where I was going with this. Yeah, so again, I think extraordinarily helpful and particularly helpful when you're a little bit on the fence about, particularly in the higher risk patient categories. So these are the patients that you're not sort of charging off to the OR with, you're really trying to understand the, the balance of risks and understanding if those PA pressures come down with appropriate diuresis and takes a patient from possibly class 2A um, you know, indications for intervening to you've taken those off the table um, or you've achieved a real reduction in symptoms um, and, and sort of taken the drive for, for surgery off the table. And again, it will be very interesting to see how that approach translates into um, a much more transcatheter driven arena where I think, again, you, you're going to be facing a, a new group of physicians that are equally trigger happy when it comes to intervening. Um, there's, a, there's a question from uh, Dr. Gearson for the clinical trial. Are there steps taken to standardize interpretation of uh, mitral regurgitation severity across various centers. Yes, we have a core lab run by Judy Hung. So all uh, pre, post and interoperative echoes will be uh, independently reviewed. Um, because that is an incredibly big challenge um, given that this is unblinded from an echo standpoint. You, you can very clearly see if a patient's had a clip or a surgical repair, one and two, the challenges of assessing mitral regurgitation in the setting of a surgical or transcatheter intervention. Dr. Chikwe, just a question for you from my end. As we evaluate these patients, like you said, you know, early uh, for surgical repair, what do you do? What's your typical practice when there is sort of a mismatch of information, either between the left ventricular ejection fraction or LV dilatation? And I mean, you talked a little bit about the differences with the echo. What do you do with these patients where the data doesn't you know line up in terms of the severity of MR or the effects on their left ventricle? So I, a really interesting question and it's funny I was invited to um, um, sort of contribute to uh, Vanderbilt's um, MDT and uh, it, it's we had this exact discussion on Monday um, about a patient that's been followed clearly for a long time with discordant echo findings and so the first thing is to look at the images sit down and look at the images the, the report is of interest but you've got to see the images and if you can't um, see very very clearly the mechanism of the MR the sort of dimensions that are being looked at on echo it I think it's about Oftentimes it's about simply repeating the transthoracic echo. So it doesn't have to be a jump to transesophageal echo. I literally told a skinny patient last week who'd come with this echo, grainy images. I am not confident that anything on the report is what I'm seeing on the images. I think we can just repeat the transthoracic and get just a better, more granular understanding. For patients that have this very borderline about a severity of MR, which is one of the key sort of decision points. So often because they've got multiple jets or eccentric jets that aren't well visualized, and that's where a transesophageal echo becomes incredibly useful. It's incredibly useful if the windows are poor because of um, body habitus, and it's incredibly important when you're talking about repairability, because the second bit of it is, is really trying to understand, are you seeing sort of this like Barlow's thickened um, multi-segment prolapse, where it's not a slam dunk um, versus very straightforward um, single segment prolapse. Um, there was a good discussion about MRI and having read the literature on MRI, I am still not entirely convinced that MRI contributes as much to the conversation as some of its proponents, proponents would say. I would much rather put a patient, if I'm still on the fence, on a treadmill and then look at their heart again and really see how much their MR increased or did it, how much their PA pressures bump, what did their LV do when stressed. And at the end of the day, if I'm on the fence, then you absolutely don't need to intervene. Um, but if symptoms match up, um, with a story or if left atrial dilatation is suggesting that we're, we're missing grades of MR, it really behoves you to sort of walk down that line of 
better trans transthoracic, good transesophageal um, echo stress. Thank you. I think we have room for maybe just one more question since we're at the top of the hour. Well, that's a really tricky yeah. one about whether there are any new information about the pathogenesis of degenerative mitral valve disease that might allow us eventually to medically intervene and interrupt the progression. And um, there is some emerging data in terms of the genetics. The role of medical intervention is just, I think, very, very difficult to um, value since it's, it's such a sort of structural and such a chronic disease. So I think um, that's still a sort of space to be watched. Um, but clearly the focus right now is really on uh, um, optimizing the timing of intervention and the, the sort of um, techniques of intervention. Yeah. All right, Dr. Chikri, again, a very big thank you uh, from us here for spending the hour with us. It was absolutely fantastic. And we hope sometime in the near future to see you in person uh, here in New Haven. Thank you again very much and thanks everyone. Thank you very, very much indeed.